Chris Galsey here with Matt Owl. And on this episode of The First Run, Matt and I are going to discuss Nate Parker's The Birth of a Nation. Matt, this is a film that had a lot of buzz, pre-Oscar buzz, a little independent film uh, about the uh, Nat Turner uh, slave rebellion that took place in Virginia back in 1831. And there's just been a lot of buzz about the film, but also a lot of controversy. And um, we finally caught up with that one this week. We also began our, excuse me, our continued our horror marathon with Tales of Halloween, an anthology film from late last year, 2015. And then we're going to run through to Matt. I think here's the problem, right? When you're 324 as of today, episodes in, you start to run out of top five ideas. So now we're going to start digging in a little deeper. And the problem is I still don't have a really good catchy name for this. So right now it's the five best performances from a film based on true life or true events or I, yeah. So it rolls, it rolls if, right off the tongue. It's like music. It's, it's beautiful. So we're going to talk about all of that and more, but let's start things off with a clip from the birth of a nation. You're free. Battle's begun, Mom. Sam. Sam is gonna take you to Reese's. Now I need you to take care of Cherry and Joanna until I get back, you hear? So Matt, as I stated, Birth of a Nation is a film about the Nat Turner-led slave rebellion in Southampton County, Virginia, back in 1831. The film stars uh, Nate Parker, who plays the titular. Well, no, it's not titular because it's not the name of the title. But he plays <laughs> this, the character Nat, Nat Turner. Uh, Army Hammer plays our, uh, our, our owner, sl our slave owner here as well. We also have Jackie Earl Haley as a... What's his role? He's like a slave rounder upper. I know there's a specific title for that job position at the time, though mm -hmm. I would I, I'd hate to see that resume. And then uh, Penelope and Miller, Gabrielle Union, and some other roles as well. So, Matt, I don't know where to begin. So I think what we should do base, maybe is just – we talked a little bit about the controversy surrounding this film a few weeks ago and the discussion we had briefly about being able to separate art from the artist. But uh, let's focus first and see what the conversation brings us, though. Let's talk just about the film itself. So the movie had a lot of buzz. Um, an early potential favorite for an Oscar nomination, Matt. Do those odds still hold? Do you think it has a chance at an Oscar nom? Um, I really don't know. I um... I, mean, I know we were kind of tabling this part of the discussion, but I don't know if the kind of controversy surrounding it about the filmmaker um, and some of the things that have come to light from his past are going to tarnish this. Um, well, let's but, let's pull that out, right? On the merits right. of the film, which I guess is really an impossible thing to really go through, right? Because you can't once the stuff that's happened has happened, and you know, let's let's not. All right, fine. Let's not dance around it because it's. I think we're doing a disservice if if we dance around it at this point. Nate Parker, back when he was in college, him and a buddy of his allegedly raped a woman. Okay. She, uh, his friend was um, charged. He actually went to jail. He went to prison. Nate was acquitted. Uh, so nothing ever happened to him. And he feels that it was in the past. He was proven to be innocent. So it shouldn't be held against him. Unfortunately, the woman herself took her own life a few years ago. So, given the one of the conceits of the film is the fact that one of the things that starts Nat Turner's rebellion, one of the things that inspires him, is the rape of his wife. Outside of everything else he witnesses, uh, and I think part of the issue is Nat, excuse me, that Nate Parker uh, wrote the screenplay and directed this film as well as stars in it. 
So he has a heavy hand in this whole thing. All right, so we've discussed what the controversy is. Uh, if it's possible, Matt, take that out of it. Say you're winning cold. Watch this film. What are your thoughts? If you can, can you let me ask, is that a fair question? Can you do that? I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I can. Um, so, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I heard the buzz of this film. Um, this isn't, you know, I understand it's a, it's an important part of American history and it happened and all that kind of stuff. But it's usually not something I like to go watch. I don't ever, I've never seen 12 years a slave. Oh, um, Matthew, you have to, I'm sorry, but I hate to interrupt you, but and, and try and maintain your train of thought. <laughs> but 12 Years a Slave is a film of gorgeous horror. It is one of the most beautiful films I've ever seen and also one of the most heart-wrenching. It's it. I've seen it a couple times now because it's so beautiful, but it's also, the horror in it is so real. And I think, I, I remember seeing at the time and feeling like, I think it, it really hits home and I think Birth of a Nation is, a, is successful at this as well, is how horrible everything was there. I feel like, you know, you read it in the history books. I said this at the time as well when we talked about 12 Years a Slave. Uh, it's, it's something different with seeing it on the screen. You know, actually seeing everything portrayed, it really drives home. Maybe it's, maybe it's my own weakness or failing to not uh, have it impact me as emotionally as it does when I see it on the big screen. Uh, but still, I think um, it's a it's a fantastic film, and though I th and I think everybody, I, it's I, I don't know if I feel the same way about this film as I do Twelve Years a Slave, where I think everybody should have to watch Twelve Years a Slave. I feel like it should be required viewing for everybody in this country. I don't know if I feel that way about this film, but can, and we'll we'll talk about that. But I'm sorry, continue your thought. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I, I haven't I haven't seen it, so I can't. You know, that's the the film that I, you know, obviously would draw the obvious comparisons because it's it's you know relatively the same subject matter. Um, you know, um, do I think I think this film could get nominated, but I don't think it could win. I don't think it's got enough to it. Um, you know, it, it goes through the beats. Um, of the rebellion and kind of the seeds of that, but I don't know. I like, I mean, I'm not convinced that Nate Parker is a very good actor in, in, in doing uh, Nat Turner to me. Um, I'm not sure he's really up to the task of pulling it off. Um, I would, I'm inclined to agree you know, with you except for that scene with his wife after she's mm -hmm. been brutally attacked and he's going to kill the people, find out who, who did it, and then kill them. And she reminds him of God and, and, and his plan and, and um, let God sort it out or something to that effect. And I felt his performance in that moment was the most real and authentic that I saw from him in the entire film. I think he nailed, absolutely nailed that scene. The rest of the film, I would say solid. But that, yeah. that one, that three, four minutes, uh, Essential, perfect viewing, perfect. Okay, um, so I mean, I you know, I <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I just didn't, I just didn't connect with the story as much on a personal level. Like it didn't, you know, it wasn't as a visceral experience as I was expecting to. I mean, and granted, it was it was very uncomfortable while I was watching all this stuff, and it, you know, kind of faced with this, you know, um, reality of it. Um, but at the same time, I felt. I felt distance from it. I don't, and I don't know why. I don't know if that was a, a failing of the filmmakers or, um, you know, that they couldn't bring it home more. And, and that's the best way I can say it. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I had a bit of that same feeling. I was, I actually thought that the film was, it was more experiential than I felt it was thought provoking. It was a vis it was a visceral experience for me. I don't think it had the there's some there was something missing. It didn't for me have the gravitas that Twelve Years a Slave did, uh, but I think part of that is that Nate Parker may, it may not be the director that Steve McQueen is. But this is I believe Parker's first film, so mm -hmm. I want to cut him a little slack there as well. Listen, for this to be your first film, to tackle something like this, uh, I have to I respect that. 
All right. And I think what he does achieve, what he does here is mostly successful. I think that's, I think it's a fair point that you mentioned that it's not, for me, it's not transcendent. All right. It, 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 it's, I just there's some issues I have with the film. Chiefly for me, I think the female characters are criminally underdeveloped. I feel that they're more um, they exist more maybe to add some morality and also more even more so just to advance. I think the plot of of the film. They don't have uh, like the grandmother. His grandmother provides a scene, and then she passes away. His wife, for there almost even. Even, even though her suffering is 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 horrible, I still feel that she just is just there to spark the next part of the film where we get this where things start to you know roll downhill and then and the rebellion starts. So I think if they were basically fridged the whole thing, all the female characters were fridged. I'm not familiar with that term. I'm not that hip. What does fridged mean? Uh, it's basically when you. It means when you kill a female character just for the sole purpose of motivating the male character to action. Is that a that's a Green Lantern reference, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> You're such a geek, and I'm a geek for knowing that. Poor Colin. <laughs> so yes, I think my I guess so. I think the issue is I think the film rambles a bit. Uh, it's it's not as I think it's not as focused as I think it could be. But I will tell you, as I said, it's a visceral experience. The film felt real and authentic to me, Matt. I still think it had a powerful message, and I am imp- one thing I was impressed about. I think same thing with Twelve Years a Slave. Is just the fact that this film even exists. I think is interesting. Uh, I I gotta admit I was, I was moved a lot as this thing played out. Mostly just viewing the suffering, I felt I found to be difficult. I felt when I walked out of it. And I don't mean to say this, and I actually said this to my wife, and I don't mean this in a flippant way at all. I just said, when I, actually, when I went to go, when I was going to see it, I said, right, I'm going to go watch this movie now. I'm going to feel horrible for being a white person. And then I'm gonna, after I walk out, I'm going to thank God that I'm a white person. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's this weird kind of, I don't know. And I, and I think the film has that emotional heft to it. It's just that the artistry itself, it's not the art house film that some people have said it is, though it's not the exploitation film that other people have called it as well. I think it's a film of middling genius. I think that there's potential here, and it's a and it's an emotional story that's relatively well told. And then I, and that's me putting aside the controversies. Yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that this is. I, I don't. I, I don't. No, I expected the like you said a transcendent experience after all the early buzz this thing got. How it was the most powerful thing coming out of the film festival circuit, and you know it was going to be something that was going to be an experience. You know, a, a true cinema experience. That you know, it's maybe one of those things, but it just wasn't for me. And um, I think that description is accurate. And so far as you know, I think it's a competent film for sure. It definitely has its moments. Um, he definitely has talent as a filmmaker um but i don't think he's there yet and it's not to the point of the praise that was the early praise that it was heaped on it but i don't think it's also to your point that it's worth any of the vitriol it's getting now you know and i think a lot of that is because of the controversy Mm -hmm. uh to answer my own question do i think this will be nominated for an oscar i don't know i think it's here it depends on how i look at it if you look at it as a sheer numbers game, with well, what we've seen so far this year, I would say it has a 45% chance if we were to do a quick what are the odds. Because I haven't felt we've seen a lot of exceptionally strong films yet. Now, granted, we're not in the Oscar season, so that could all change dramatically once we get into the last month of the season, last month of the year. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. And I think for you, I agree that I think, and if we factor in the controversy, I think that drops that percentage down to maybe 20%, 15 So do I, if I had to give it a letter grade as is, as a standalone film, I would give it a B plus. I think that would be a fair assessment on my part. I think it does what it pretends to do. I think it has a powerful message that perhaps isn't as ex- executed as well as it could be. But again, first time filmmaker, 
to deliver something this viscerally impactful to me as he does. Uh, yeah, I walked out. Of, I walked out of it emotionally hit. It was. It was. It was interesting. I. I don't know. It didn't have the impact Twelve Years a Slave did. But again, I think that may be more Steve McQueen than it is, you know, Nate Parker. I don't know. I almost. Feel, I don't know if the, even. A, yeah, it's what we do, Matt. What would you give it a letter grade for you? What would you give it? Um, I think it'd be less generous. I'd probably give it a B minus. Um, you know, I think it's like I said. I think it's got a. It's got craft in there. It's got you know. Um, it's got its moments. Um, but I, I don't think it's it's earned the praise that it's got. And it's it's not something I'm ever going to revisit. I mean, you're so we were talking at the beginning of the segment about you've rewatched Twelve Years a Slave, so obviously I will have to go check this out. But this is not something I. Fair enough. If you had a, I think that's I think that's I think that's it. So if you got a chance to see, yeah, I think that's it too. Yeah, if you had a chance to see the Birth of a Nation, um, and I and, pre, and one of the things I think one of the genius things about this too is the title itself. Is taking that title and and uh, um, t- taking it taking it back from w- of what the original title of what that represents and what it means, I think is a smart and interesting move as well. So anyway, if you had a chance to see the birth of a nation, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Shoot us an email, feedback at thefirstrun.com. Matt, we've been entirely too serious, so I'm going to get a little silly. Are you ready? Are you sitting down? I'm glad you are. Yes, of course I am. You're, you can look at me right now. Let's talk about what's, co- what's coming up on Blu-ray and DVD this upcoming Tuesday, October 18th, my mother's birthday. Happy birthday, Mom. And you can pick up for your birthday if you show choose, and I hope you do not. Independence, Independence Day Resurgence. Includes a Blu-ray, DVD, digital copy. You get a steel book from Best Buy and something called a guidebook. I think it's just one of those making of type books that Target does, which is a... Uh, they do just like excerpts from the big, you know, making up books that you get at the bookstores and the Amazons and the Borders. You still go to Borders, right? Uh, includes eight deleted scenes with commentary by Roland Emmerich. Um, Matt, does this film even need to exist? I mean, I think this is one of those things where I don't think we need the sequel. We did, it, it's especially without Will Smith. What are we doing? I mean, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel. We're trying to get those uh, millennial '90s kids their butts in the seats, man. So, whatever it takes. And I didn't even like that. I didn't even like the first one. The first one was, was one of the is one of the biggest cinematic disappointments of my life. I was so well, stoked you get to watch the whole... film. Really? Yeah, no. But come on, Will Smith punches an alien. How cool is that? And they yeah, take but... it down with a MacBook. So you know what? I mean, Chris will say this. You're a little bit older than me, but, but we've discussed Barely. this before. When we were when we, we were when we were younger, a few years it might as well be like a decade as far as t- tastes go. When you're when you're younger, you know. So, <laughs> which reminds me, not to uh, just to jump real fast. Have you seen the trailer for the, the new teaser trailer for the Power Rangers film? I haven't. I've been avoiding it. I was never into Power Rangers, so I haven't really been interested. Neither was I. But I feel like that's like that ninety. Is that nineties or that aughts? Oh, that's that's definitely nineties. I remember my little brother watching that in like ninety two, ninety three. Okay, I didn't watch it either. I was I was past that at that point. So, but I guess I, I wonder if the kids are all excited about the Power Rangers, because I'm not. Alice Through the Looking Glass, another sequel that I don't know if anybody really needed, is coming out. Includes a Blu-ray, DVD, Ultraviolet Pass. He had some behind-the-scenes feature, including uh, filmmaker audio commentary by James Bobin and deleted scenes as well. Woody Allen's latest Cafe Society Matt is getting its release. So if you, I haven't seen Cafe Society. I'm gonna talk about another director with uh, some controversy, right? But hey, uh, it seems to be working. Him and Sunni yeah, are still I, together, whatever that means. Uh, I saw it. I went and saw it uh, was two it? months ago. It's actually not bad. It's uh, it's all right. It's it's middling, late period, um, inoffensive Woody Allen. It's fine. It's not transcendent though. Transcendent. Good to know. <laughs> New to no Blu-ray, Matt. I, there you go. Well, a few films are. I think the big release of this week, I'd have to say, is Criterion's release of Pan's Labyrinth. And I'll, I'll, to go along with this as well, you can buy a box set of all three uh, Del Toro films that are on Criterion releases, which are Kronos, Devil's Backbone, and now Pan's Labyrinth. It includes an all-new, great, newly graded 2K digital master supervised by Del Toro himself. It includes an alternate 7.1 surround mix as well as the original 5.1. Audio commentary by Del Toro from 2007. A new interview by novelist Cornelia Funk which is, I'm hoping it's actually pronounced funk. 
And then uh, about fairy tales, fantasy, and Pan's Labyrinth. New interview with the actor Doug Jones, who played a few key roles in that film. And uh, four making of documentaries from back in 2000. But I just, Matt, I'm telling you, I am all over this. Pan's Labyrinth from Criterion signed me up. Unfortunately, I already own Devil's Backbone and Kronos. So I don't think I'll be getting that box set. But the box set, Matt, comes with this really nice book, too, about all three films. Oh, maybe I'll just sell my other Blu-rays and get the set. Because this thing is gorgeous. What is wrong with you? <laughs> what? I like Del Toro. I know. I know. <laughs> hey, you know what? You 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 were the benefit of my upgrades. What did I send you recently? You got uh. You uh, got uh, Star Trek. Star Trek uh, two. Right. right. On. And and I just picked up the all new Scream Factory version of the thing. Do you have the thing on Blu Ray? Mm. The Universal. I, I, I don't. Well, you don't. will shortly, unless you're going to keep Not being a defects, jerk, brother. <laughs> I take it back. I take it all back. Maybe I'll keep them both because they're both they have different color timings. They're both kind of different mm -hmm. transfers. Like I have all my, yeah, that's right. I'll rotate them too. Like I have my, I have all my Bowie Masters. Like I have. Okay, let me let me a little aside. I love talking about this. So, <laughs> for I have like every everything David Bowie's ever put out, right? But I also have the different versions. So I have the RCA Masters of the Bowie CDs, Matt. And if you're familiar with the RC, these are the ones that they actually took the vinyl. And transferred it to CD, so this they, they these are considered the purest sounding ones, right? Then I have the Ryko CDs, which have all the bonus tracks, but they're a little tinny. Uh, and then I have the remasters from '99, and then I've been click picking up the new ones as well as they come out. But I think one of the coolest things is the Harry Maslin mix of Station to Station, which was previously available in the Station to Station big box set, is now part of the Who Can I Be Now box set, Matt. And the Station Station Maslin mix is so different. It's, but I love it. It sounds like, Matt, you're in the studio while they're recording the album. That's, it's, it's gorgeous. So I can choose from like four or five different versions of Station to Station that's to listen to. So I'll do that with the thing. You do that with the thing? You just have it <laughs> playing into on two, on double monitors. You're going to be like, oh, oh, I much prefer the color selection here. <laughs> exactly. Craig Turner is also getting a shortcut, a new 4K digital transfer of Robert Altman's classic film, an alternate 5.1 surround mix, conversations between Altman and actor Tim Robbins from 2004, and some other features as well, including some deleted scenes. Scream Factory is giving us a deluxe edition of Child's Play. There's going to be 2,000 of these, Matt, that come with a five and a half foot tall Good Guys Chucky doll, a limited edition 18 by 24 poster um, of the newly designed cover art, a second slip cover made exclusively for this limited edition. A limited edition 18 by 24 poster of the Good Guys Doll artwork. And then finally, uh, you get it two weeks early if you got it from uh, Scream Factory. So I don't know did if you say did, did you say five and a half feet tall? Yes. That can't be right. Five and a half. It's got to be five like, and a half. That, I mean, that's as, that's as big as a, that's as big as an adult. Yeah, that's a short true. adult. <laughs> I have to. I must have misread that. That's got to be five and a half inches, which is not that big. No, that makes. But much, I mean, that makes much more sense though. Than five and a half foot <laughs> tall. <laughs> that would be terrifying. Which would you rather have? I. <laughs> If you get there's a new bonus features, uh, there's a new 2K scan, a new audio commentary with the director Tom Holland as well, uh, and some other old ported over co documentaries, excuse me, commentaries and special features, and some other bunch of new ones as well, some special effects ones. So if you're a big fan of Child's Play, which I never have been, I never got into it, uh, but you can pick that up. Man, did you ever see The Pit? Yeah, I did a long time ago. Well, Scream's giving us that on Blu-ray as well. If you're not familiar, the pit is about a kid who he gets beat up, right? He's, he, he gets bullied around, and he finds a pit in the middle of the woods with a bunch of cannibalistic troglodytes at the bottom of it that he then has to come up with these elaborate reasons to get these people out that he just pushes them into the pit. But you can pick that up. It's a whole all-new high-definition transfer, Matt, of you, one of your favorite films, The Pit. Vestron Video is giving us Waxwork 1 and Waxwork 2. Includes audio commentary with director Anthony Hickox and actor Zach Galligan. And some other featurettes as well. Uh, whatever. And then uh, Scream is giving us Body Snatchers. The one from the 70s, though, with Donald Sutherland, which is a great film. If you haven't seen that version of Body Snatchers, 
It is fantastic. It's one of those weird, odd things, Matt, with the Body Snatchers movies that whenever they remake it, it's always good. I don't know what it is, but there hasn't been a bad one, except unless you count Invasion, which with Nicole Kidman and Daniel Craig. That's that actually, fun. that's a bit of a stinker. But the other ones are good. <laughs> and then, hey, of course. Three times. Three times. Pretty good. Three out of four. 75%. Yeah, that's not that's the good. gentleman's C right there. That's right. And then uh, Arrow is giving us a single disc release of Bride of the Reanimator. They had a big version of it previously, but now you can just pick up just a disc. Your straight to DVD pick of the week, Matt. The write up itself is not that interesting. So I'm just, I just chose it because of the title, which is Hillbilly Bloodbath. Witnessing this terrifying tale of depravity, cannibalism, and torture, set in a small town in the backwoods of Kentucky, Hillbilly Bloodbath, also known as Red River, tells the tale of Roland Thatcher, a family man, a businessman, a man of God, and a man who doesn't take kindly to strangers. When a group of city kids sets up camp on a city, blah, 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 we all know what it is. Anyway, I just like the title, Hillbilly Bloodbath. Matt, do you have any streaming picks of the week for us this week? Yes, I do, Chris. Yes, I do. So, um, the um, did we did we review corn gall for the for for the show? Corn dogs? No, we don't review corn dogs for the show. Corn gall nerd. No, it was the, so basically this is a this is a documentary. This is a follow up documentary to uh, Restrepo, which I know we did for the show, um, which is about you know obviously uh, soldiers in Afghanistan. Um, this is the follow up to that. Um, and it talks about how, you know, their experiences of these Marines in, in Afghanistan and how it impacts, you know, their lives on the front line and, um, you know, the, the people that they're, you know, fighting against and with, um, it's, it's really good. Um, it's not as good as Restrepo. It's not as focused as Restrepo, but it is, it is a really good follow up to the film. And I think you cut out on us. So it was Corindal. That's the one you're talking about, right? Yes, corn gall. Yes, thank you. You you were it's it's you're you're cutting out a bit. So I just wanted to make sure the kids at home all heard that. So yes, I remember Restrepo too. I heard corn gall wasn't quite as good, but uh, Restrepo that's, it's that's not a, quite as good, but it's still very good. That's a pull. Like that's like one of the first few months of the show, right? I think when we we did Restrepo. Yeah, it was. Correctly. It was. Hey, I got a good I got a good memory for those shows that I was there. I was pretty good for it. That's right. I saw Zootopia, which is on Netflix uh, this past weekend, which I rather enjoyed. The misses, not as impressed. Uh, no. But I actually really, I really liked it a lot. So I'm glad I was finally able to catch up with it. All right, Matt. I don't know. Would you, you like? You saw Zootopia, right? You got a kid. You must have seen it. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was good. It was good. I mean, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't my favorite, but uh, I enjoyed it. Fair enough. All right. So that's that's the big releases, Matt. Let's go ahead and take a break then, come back, and let's talk about the tales of Halloween. Spirits roam the earth tonight. Do you know why we wear costumes on Halloween? It's so the dead won't know who's alive. <laughs> Their night, and while some of them like mingling with the living, there are others who don't like to be seen at all. There's one ghost who hates it more than any of the others. Mary Bailey was laughed at her whole life. She died being bullied and unloved, all because she had a disfigured face. Now it's her turn to have the last laugh. She comes back every Halloween to taunt the living and to laugh at them behind their backs. So, just a word of warning tonight. If you find yourself alone on the way back and you hear an evil cackle and footsteps behind you, I wouldn't turn around. Because if she finds you looking, when you least expect it, she's going to take your eyes. <laughs> All right, man, I'm going to be straight with you here. I think we both can say that we both love um, these types of films, right? The, the uh, 
the Halloween, the, the horror, films. the anthology. See, I don't know why I was blanking on the term anthology, <laughs> but the Halloween, the horror anthology films, we're a big fan of. The problem is, almost every single time, they let us down. Mm-hmm. Or well, maybe we'll have one segment, maybe two that's really strong, like Trick or Treat. I actually enjoy a lot. I'd say Trick or Treat's pretty solid all the way through. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the one we saw? Was it was it ABCs of De- no, it wasn't ABC's of death. What was the one that had the um, the VHS? One that, yes, it was a VHS two that had the the one in Japan or in one of the Asian yeah, countries. Yeah, called was the Savior one or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That thing was fantastic. But the was directed by the guy who did the raid. Yeah, right? there you go. Well, there you go. Yeah. So tales of Halloween, Matt. This time we have ten. Count them ten. Little short stories that are r- r- vaguely intertwined. Um, they are particularly at the end. Uh, one, we have Sweet Tooth, right? We have yep. The Night Billy Raised Hell, Trick, The Weak and the Wicked, Ding Dong, This Means War, Friday the 31st, The Ransom of Rusty Rex, and Bad Seed. Matt, I have to say, here are the ones that I enjoyed the most, and we'll get into this. Sweet Tooth, The Night Billy Raised Hell, and then probably Trick. There's a problem. I I can't think of a, of a more clear example of diminishing returns in an anthology film in my entire <laughs> life. It really starts off, I felt, rather strong and just gets worse and worse and worse. And I think, I think the most interesting one for me would have been Trick, but I think that's the one that needs the most development. Trick was the one that where uh, these, this, these, these kids in their 20s are hanging out, they're getting high, and they get basically terrorized by a bunch of vigilante trick-or-treaters. And we don't know right. why. But they're in, mm-hmm. finally is the reveal as to why. But I feel like that reveal wasn't executed as well as it should have been. I really feel that it was lacking something that I can't really put my finger on. But that would have been, for me, the most interesting one. Uh, Sweet Tooth, I thought was fun, but the one I enjoyed the most, I think, would be the night Billy raised hell, which is a young man. He knocks on the door, and it happens to be the devil. And the devil takes this young boy, perhaps, out to do a whole bunch of pranks and tricks throughout the neighborhood. And I probably had the most fun with that one. Where do you come down on uh, Tales of Halloween? Uh, so, um... I was thoroughly unimpressed with Tales of Halloween. I was very disappointed. It didn't have that kind of one or two that like really got a hold of me. Um, honestly, I think they were all kind of too short. I don't think. I think they tried to cram too many in here, and they didn't have as much room to breathe. Um, I think they could probably could have done this better with half of that. Um, to be quite honest with you, and I know this is the wrong choice, but. Friday the 31st, just when they just embraced how stupid this whole thing was and just how this was a dumb movie. Like, I, it wasn't good, but I at least enjoyed watching it while it was, you know, going on, um, even though it was terrible. Um, but yeah, yeah, the only um, one that, the only one that, yeah, most, me, the only one that made me jump was probably Grim Grinning Ghost. It was the only one that had the, oh, oh mm-hmm. gee, I, I jumped. But I think Friday the 13th is, a, is an interesting oh, yeah. too. I wrote that one down because. Uh, that's the one that's a mix between Friday the 30th, 13th, Little Evil Dead, and then we mix in some um, alien abduction alien. invasion type stuff. Uh, it was easily right. the goriest, I think, out of all of them, too, if I remember correctly. So, yeah, uh, yeah I, that one was okay, too. I think the one that bothered me the most was Bad Seed, because that was the one written and directed by Neil Marshall, mm-hmm. who is a director whose work... This man lives and breathes pulp, B-movie, high-end B-movie schlock kind of stuff. And his was the weakest, I think, out of all of them. Bad Seed is about a genetically engineered man-eating pumpkin that terrorizes the town. Which I think could have been fun, it could have been good, but for me was the weakest out of all of them. Except maybe the Ransom of Rusty Rex I thought was pretty bad too. Uh... No, actually, I think the worst one for me, the absolute worst, would have to be This Means War, which is where the two neighbors were warring over the Halloween decorations, and they ended up having a fight. That was probably the weakest out of all of them. Yeah, but really I bad. think the biggest disappointment for me would be Bad Seed because of Neil Marshall. What do you think? Yeah, um, yeah, it was it was definitely the weakest one. But I mean, there were some there were some good competition, like you 
you know, um, Ding Dong was was pretty was pretty bad. Um, Conceptually, I like the idea of that one. Yeah, but the execution was just was just awful. Um, this that, means that, war. Also, I agree with you. And Ding Dong, I want to tell people too that was this woman who, in her in her in her husband, she, they're desperate. She really wants to have a kid. And all these trick or treaters keep coming up, and it makes her angry and anger her. But she's also there's, she's a witch, right? And we find out really what she wants. She doesn't want a kid. She wants to eat a kid. Right. <laughs> she wa- It's kind of a Hansel and Gretel type thing. But like you say, is exceptionally poorly executed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I mean, this, these things had some some you know had some seeds and some good ideas. But I think uh, this could have again, they could have just if they had maybe cut half of these and kind of expanded them out a little bit more. Um, it probably could have been better. Uh, but I think they just kind of threw too much stuff up here and, it, and none of it really stuck. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. That's too bad. I was looking forward to this one. Um, I don't know if it's, yeah. if you could, I would probably say watch trick or treat over this. If, if you haven't seen trick or treat, I would have to mm-hmm. say that is a far superior film. Um, if you haven't seen it, I'm, I still, you know what, Matt? I still say I think it's worth watching. I do. I just, I just like horror anthology. I think part of the appeal of these anthology films is that you never, <laughs> it's going to, you know, it's going to be a mixed bag. And I think I, I, I'm gonna, I enjoyed it enough or I would recommend it. I would give it probably a C plus, but I would say, you know, if you like this kind of stuff, go ahead. Just, just prepare yourself. Lower those expectations, folks. And try and have a little fun with it. Yeah, I'm. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to. Uh, team co-host here. I cannot. I cannot recommend this one um, at all. Um, I would. I would feel it's. It's not. It's my civic duty to warn you against this. And I think uh, <laughs> you have better options out there. Um, trick what about? Treat. What about the top three? What if they watch Sweet Tooth and Night Billy Ray's Tell and Trick, and then tell and tell everybody to walk the, to, to turn off the TV? Would you be in, on board for that or no? I, Sure, but it'd be hour. over in. I mean, it'd be over in like 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> All right. You might as well go watch a Treehouse of Horror or something. You'd probably have a better time doing it, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I would. I would watch Trick or Treat, um, VHS movies if you haven't seen those. Um, but just the first two. Avoid yeah, just the that first two, last. Yeah. Especially avoid that last one. I'm telling you. It, yeah. Viral yeah. VHS viral is. Not good, um, and we've got you know what, and you know what, we've got another chance. We 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 found another kind of anthology film, or not really an anthology, but it is like short films, short horror films put together that we're going to look at for later in the month. So hopefully that one's here's fingers crossed that that one's going to be good. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> you're not. You're not. You're not we'll confident see. on that one. I don't know. It, it, seems, it seems like it go. It, it's a relatively interesting trailer, but that one really looks like it can go either way. <laughs> So it sounds like it's right up your alley. <laughs> Basically. I'm sure I'll be praising it by the end. If you've got a chance to see Tales of Halloween, shoot us an email at feedback at thefirstrun.com. Matt, let's take a break and uh, let's discuss what we think are the uh, five best mo- performances based on true stories. Does that sound better? I, I don't know. Actual it's, it's, it's poetry. It's music. So, it's perfect. We'll, we'll, yeah. You want my number. I do. I do want your number. Which number do you want, George? George. Now, I like the way you say that, George. Uh, Well, how many numbers you got? Oh, I got numbers coming out of my ears. For instance, ten. Ten? Yeah. That's how many months old my baby girl is. You got a little girl? Yeah. Yeah, sexy, huh? How about this for number six? That's how old my other daughter is. Eight is the age of my son. Two is how many times I've been married and divorced. Sixteen is the number of dollars I have in my bank account. Eight five zero three nine four three. That's my phone number. And with all the numbers I gave you, I'm guessing zero is the number of times you're going to call it. Hey, how the hell do you remember your bank balance right off the top of your head like that? See, that impresses me. Uh-huh. You're dead wrong about that zero thing, baby. Now, I feel like from the get go we should have we should have knocked we should have said one one performance cannot be included on this list because I think it's going to be both of our number ones, and if it's not, I don't know if I even know you as a person. <laughs> I can almost guarantee we have the same the same one on the on the on the first on the, that list. So, 
All right, we can right, we'll we can we can do like a one two three at the same time when we get to number one. I suppose since it's going to be the same. All right, all right, so I'll start off. I'll give you the ultimate number one since uh, you went first last week. Our number five is going to be. I'm going to go with Martin Landau as Bela Lugosi and Ed Wood. I think that uh, Landau brings not only he's not just the humor in that film, though. Johnny Depp is <laughs> brings a lot of that too. But there's there's a there's a a warmth and a sadness to Landau's performance that really comes across. Um, he doesn't just, it's not just him doing this Eastern European accent for laughs, right? There's much more, I feel, there's much more depth to that performance. And I think you may even realize when you, the first time watching that, there's a melancholiness uh, considering to the guy who is basically typecast as Dracula for his entire life that Landau just really imbues. And I think it's possibly the strongest thing about that entire film. He was nominated for an Academy Award for that movie. So that's why I ended up making it my number five. It's a film I haven't watched in quite a while, Matt, but I really wanted to give Landau his due for that. Good pick. That is a good pick. You're um, welcome. So, Chris, my number five is uh, Ray Fiennes. Some people would say Ralph, but he would say Rafe, um, as would. Eamon Goth in, in Schindler's List. Um, Fines plays the uh, uh, the commandant, the head of the concentration camp where Schindler gets his workers from. Um, he's basically, you know, he, he is the villain of the film. Um, and he just plays him with just this creepy intensity, this kind of mundane cruelty. Um, it, it's really... It really makes your skin crawl when you realize that people like this actually existed, um, you know, and, you know, this is, these are the things that, that they actually did. Um, and he's, you know, he, he is um, fascinating to watch, even though you loathe him the whole time you're watching him. That is a great pick. Uh, Liam Neeson ended up as one of my honorable mentions. It didn't even occur to me to choose Ray Fine. So uh, that, is a, that is a great pick, Matt. Good on you. Uh, my number four is a bit of a layup. I went with uh, Joe Pesci as Tommy De Simeone in uh, Goodfellas. Okay. Uh, basically, a role that I think that defined Pesci for the rest of his career, and it's one of the most standout, almost like knock you over the head performances that you'll ever see. I mean, he is terrifying and hilarious in that film. And he, I feel like he, outside of that, and what well, Mike cousin Vinny, right? But I really feel Goodfellas is what really made Joe Pesci who he is. And that performance, man, I don't know how many times this, have you heard that line, you know? How do how am I funny? What do I make you laugh? Am I a clown? So it is just a it, it it's it's the humor and the horror that he just weaves together so perfectly as that character is why it's so strong and effective for me. It's it's so memorable. It's one of the more memorable performances I think I've ever seen. So uh, that's why I went with uh, my buddy Joe. About Joey, Joey uh, Shinebox. Is that what they used to call that's him? Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, my number four is um, John Hurt as uh, Joseph Merrick and the Elephant Man. Um, you know, uh, Hurt plays uh, obviously Merrick, who was a you know he had horrible congenital deformities and he was uh you know found in in uh victorian london in, in victorian england acting in a sideshow and then he gets brought by anthony Topkins' character down to london and they study him and his you know his deformities and her you know kind of plays it even underneath all this makeup um you know you can really sense the kind of humanity and the gentleness of him like, you know with all this ugliness around him he really plays up the um you know the, the humanity of this this guy as a gentle soul, and it, it's it's really kind of a um, beautiful film as far as and, and it's directed by David Lynch. It's Lynch's most accessible film. It's his most kind of straight up narrative film. This is like his you know there's no kind of Lynchian weirdness in it really, other than the fact that it has a guy who's the star is is a majorly deformed guy. But um, yeah, I really enjoy the Elephant Man. Um, and I heard it's fantastic. I you know I've never actually seen it, so. No, you should check it out. I don't know if it's, yeah, you know David Bowie portrayed Merrick on Broadway in The Elephant Man. Do you know that? One man show. Thank you for informing me. <laughs> really? Mm hmm. And he did, I believe so. But he did the whole. He did a deformity just by holding his body oddly. Oh, okay. That was his thing. Rave reviews. I still miss you, David. All right, my number three 
It's got to be George C. Scott as Patton in Stripes. In Patton. So, Matt, I I remember it was just like the first real war film that I ever saw was Patton. I had the two, two tape VHS of Patton, and I used to watch it because my grandfather used to talk about Patton. He was a fan of his. My grandfather was in the hospital um, recovering from the, I think that's, he was shot three times in, in World War II. I was like, Grandpa. But still, um, he, so he was in the hospital in Italy when Patton slapped that sh- soldier. He didn't see it. But he was there, and then the apology thing that happened. So that was one of his favorite stories. So I watched that film when I was a young kid, bought it on VHS, and must have watched it, I don't know, half a dozen times easily within the first couple months. And I love Scott in that film. Funny thing, though, the real Patton, from what I understand, actually kind of had a high-pitched voice, uh, which Scott clearly does not have. So, But it is such a strong kind of commanding performance. He imbues, he lives, he becomes... George Patton in this film. Uh, it's still probably my favorite, probably my favorite war film. That's, I don't know. I have to think about that. But uh, still a remarkable piece of filmmaking uh, buoyed entirely by the performance of George C. Scott. So that's why it's my number three. Matt, I also want to point out, I think it's the sixth time in the last three weeks I've used the term buoyed. Is it? Well, I'm glad you're keeping track because I certainly am not, but I will now keep track going forward. <laughs> Um, all right, so my number three is your number five, Martin Landau as, as Melo Lugosi and Ed mm-hmm. Wood. Um, you know, I can't add anything more to it, really. I mean, he's he's the heart of that film. He's the pathos of his performance is, is um, just heartbreaking. And, and he's also freaking hilarious. It's he, he, You know, there's a lot of funny in that film, um, a lot of, you know, kind of uh, funny that breaks your heart. And I think a lot of it comes from, from uh, Landau's performance, for sure. Yeah, I, I entirely agree with you. Obviously, though, I guess I didn't like it as much as you did. No My number tour, number number tour, just how we say it <laughs> here in Florida. Number tour. Right, I, I remember that, that weird Florida pronunciation. You yeah, from Florida, you know yeah. that. Uh, for everybody else, two. Okay. Number two is Chutella Geofor as Solomon Northrup in Twelve Years a Slave. We talked about it earlier, so I won't get that much into it. But uh, another film entirely, Matt, as they say buoyed by the performance of one actor. So uh, all the suffering that G4 goes through in that film, it's but in that suffering like like uh, Leo DiCaprio, right, in um, The Revenant, which is an honorable mention for me, but it's, there is a, a pain that he's able to, to pass along to us. And then when Northrop is finally freed, and reunite with his family. But when that moment, Matt, when he is freed, I was crying like a baby. It's And it's all because of the G4. Absolutely brilliant in this film. The, the man who you can see his refusal to give up, given these impossible situation. If you're not familiar with the film, he plays a gentleman named Solomon Northrup who was kidnapped He's a free man in, in New England who was kidnapped and sold into slavery. And eventually, years later, free. 12 years, to be exact. So, uh, yeah, no, it's absolutely a, an absolutely devastating performance. Uh, so that's why it's my numero tour. There you go. That's number number tour. Very good. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pleased you enjoy it. Yeah. Um, all right, so... With the exception of my number one, I think what are going to be our collective number one, this 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 performance is literally one of the most accurate portrayals I've ever seen. Just having read the man's work, listened to the man speak, watched the man on TV, this guy, this actor, became this individual. I'm talking about Johnny Depp as Hunter S. Thompson in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. That performance is he completely becomes Hunter S. Thompson. He lived with Hunter S. Thompson for months on end, you know, just mimicked his mannerisms, learned his speech patterns, just learned all the crazy stuff he was into. And I absolutely love that film. That film is so much fun to watch, even though it's so crazy and disgusting, but it is a, it is a good time to watch that film. And it's fun. And, and Depp is fantastic in it. 
I remember loving that film when I first saw it, Terry Gilliam film. And uh, I got to tell you, man, I haven't watched it in a long time. And I was, I'm was i nervous that it won't hold up, but you're telling me it does, huh? Oh, uh, for me, it holds up. I will, I will, that's one of those movies I'll watch every couple of years and I will enjoy it every single time. Hmm. Okay. All right. So I guess we're at, here we are at number one. Are you ready? We're ready. All right, here we go. Okay. One, two, three. Keanu Reeves is John Wick. <laughs> that was it, dude. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's a true story, right? It is. Uh, it is. And no, shot it the has, movie. It has to be De Niro as Jake LaMotta. There's no other selection. None. That, you're absolutely correct. That is what it is. So Raging Bull, Scorsese, a film that let's 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 he did not win <laughs> Best Picture or Best Direction. For Raging Bull, I want to let's talk. Let's let's focus on that. All right, mm. that did not. That is considered right the greatest theft in the history of the Oscars, isn't it? Uh, it's up there. It, it, yeah, I think it is up there. So it's De Niro who gained what 30, 40 pounds or something like that to uh, yeah. play Jake LaMotta in the later years, and uh, the commitment to that performance. It's considered it, one of the, if not the greatest performance of all time. And uh, specifically for a story based on true events or true life or however we want to, whatever we want to call it. So, uh, but it's it's heartbreaking. It's sad. It's I don't know, Matt. It's it's just a, it's an experience. Uh, what are you? Uh, what are your thoughts on De Niro as Jake LaMotta? Yeah, I mean, he he totally embodies. This is again, you know, he was so obsessed with making a film or playing LaMotta that he went and trained with him. He kind of spent all his time with him. Um, and I think it was even more than 30 or 40 pounds. I think he, I want to say he gained like 60 to 70 pounds to play oh, LaMotta in his later life. Um, which it, and he wasn't even, which wasn't even a huge portion of the movie, but I mean, it, but he did it anyway. Um, his dedication to, to playing this role and, um, yeah, I mean, De Niro, De Niro completely sells it. Um, it is absolutely one of the canonical films um, that's out there right now. And it's probably the best. I, I, are we going out on a limb saying it's the best biopic ever? Yeah, I think so. outside of John Wick. Yeah, I think, I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, John Wick, obviously. <laughs> and, the, and The Dark Knight, but that's a documentary. So I, I can't remember. That is a documentary. You got to back it up here a little bit, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree. So uh, let's keep him on again. Uh, that year, 1980, uh, Ordinary People won Best Picture, and Redford won for Best Director of Ordinary okay. People as well. The competition that year for Best Picture was Ordinary People, the winner, Raging Bull, Coal Miner's Daughter, The Elephant Man, and Tess. Scorsese went up against Redford, which he lost to, David Lynch in The Elephant Man, Richard Rush for The Stunt Man, and Roman Polanski, of course, for Tess. Mm -hmm. Of course, De Niro did win that year, so it wasn't a total loss. But still, ooh, still. All right, you know what? I kind of screwed over Joe Pesci, right? Because he had a big role in Raging Bull, so I I didn't really do him on honors on that because I think his performance as Joey was really good too. I mean, he was nominated for a Best Supporting Supporting Actor. So sorry, Joe. Yeah, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Yeah, but I think it was fair. I think it was a fair statement. I think he, you know, Tommy, his role as Tommy. I mean, he basically plays the same character in Casino. So yeah, true. Yeah. All right, Matt, do you have any honorable mentions? Do I? Um, I put a, let's see, I got Eisenberg as uh, Zuckerberg in The Social Network, um, Tom Hardy as Charles Bronson, not the Death Wish actor, uh, Jamie Foxx as Ray Charles, Denzel, because he's just Denzel as Malcolm X. Uh, I, you know, I I put Ray Liotta as Henry Hill from Goodfellas. Um, I thought Ray Liotta was a, was a good performance. Um, mm -hmm. Philip Seymour Hoffman as Truman Capote and uh, Bruno Gantz as Hitler and Downfall, which you, if you've never seen, now granted, this is a film that lost a billion memes, launched a billion memes, um, but it is it is a powerful film. You should really check it out if you haven't seen it. I think I don't. I don't think I think I've always meant to, and it was in my Netflix queue for a while. I don't think it's available there anymore. Uh, I never got around to seeing it. I have to check that out at some point. Uh, I am kicking myself for forgetting my bo my boy Tom Hardy and Bronson. I am mm. oh, I cannot believe I forgot that because I love that role, that film, that performance. I also had Aaron Ralston, uh, played by James Franco in 127 Hours. Mm, I had uh, Russell Crowe as Jeffrey Wigand in The Insider. As I said earlier, Liam Neeson. I got Denzel, but I uh, I haven't seen Malcolm X, unfortunately. Uh, so I had him down for Hurricane Carter. Not a great okay. film, but a great performance. Mm. 
Julia Roberts and Aaron Brockovich, Peter O'Toole launch of Arabia, as I said previously, Leo DiCaprio and The Revenant. And uh, and then the two, the one that really, another complicated film, uh, The American Sniper, uh, Bradley Cooper as Chris Kyle. Uh, mm -hmm. The first time I really saw Bradley Cooper and I was really impressed with one of his performances. I've always kind of <laughs> felt, all right, it's Bradley Cooper. Yeah, he's a pretty boy. But I was I really enjoyed him in that role. So all right. I'm sure we're forgetting a whole ton. Shoot us an email, feedback at the first run dot com. Um I heard today, Matt, that they're green lick John Wick three already. I can't okay. believe all those stories are true. But <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Matt, um coming up next week, uh eventually we may be a little longer of a break between shows because uh Matt is taking a not well deserved vacation. Mm, it's definitely not deserved, that's for sure. But we will be though. We will be the catching the company coming I'm taking it. There you go. <laughs> we'll be we'll be checking out the accountant starring Ben Affleck and in the latest film in our horror marathon, which we do not know which it will be yet. Mm. We'll know shortly. Yeah. Matt, let me ask you, you have to choose from the following comedy or cartoon, action adventure. Um, on let's cover. go. Let's go. Comedy cartoon. All right. And what two thousand? What two thousand and ten movie features the likes of Woody, Slinky, and Mister Potato Head? Two thousand and ten. Two thousand ten. Uh, Toy Story three. Correct. Okay. Whew, that was actually tough. I wasn't sure which Toy Story it was going to be. And that's why I. I, I... I focused on the 2010 to try and help you out a little bit. All right, I was going to ask. I was going to ask for you to repeat that part. So. Well, there you go. All right. Page. This is a big show this week. Check us out at thefirstrun.com. We're on YouTube, Matt. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter and Facebook. Just do a search for the first run. Scroll, 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 scroll. You'll eventually find us. <laughs> <laughs> Take a little extended break, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Take care. Bye. No, please. We're friends to the end, remember? This is the end, friend.